Welcome to Signs of the Times. I'm Dr. Willard Register, and fortunately, we still have Christian Bergdahl here. Did I say that right? That's right, Bergdahl. Bergdahl yeah. here to talk to us more about music. Now, I hope you folks, the viewers, I've been praying for you viewers between the weeks here to realize that what he has been telling us actually affects your mind mm -hmm. and your children's mind and how they act and maybe why they don't even want to eat breakfast or what they want to eat or what they don't want to eat. It can affect the whole life. But we were talking last time a little about some of the churches, the various churches out there, because there's all kinds of churches. Mm -hmm. There's a certain kind of church, you and I kind of have a sneaking idea of what they are, and we call them a celebration church. Mm -hmm. Now they work in a little more activity than where I go, because I'm a kind of a conservative, quiet guy. Uh -huh. And I, I don't know that you're quiet. Maybe conservative. <laughs> conservative. <yeah. laughs> anyway, celebration. Yes. Now, I ask you the question, then we ran out of time last program. I know you've been around a lot, three continents. I've been to every continent except the Antarctic. So I, I got, I'm up on you for right. a few continents. But I still have time. You're much older than I am. Well, that's right. You still have time. <laughs> but it's more dangerous to fly nowadays. It is, yeah. You're going to get in trouble as they pat you down. I'm going through there with all that, <laughs> co all that musical stuff. <laughs> but celebration. How yeah. are these celebration churches? I guess the question is, how are they accepting your message? Right. And number two, if they accept it, do they change? Okay. And number three, if they change, are they changing in the right direction? So sure. let's talk a little about the celebration churches. What's interesting is uh, a number of years back, I had the privilege of myself and another team. We were going around the country and doing seminars on country living and the benefits of it and getting out of the city centers where there's a lot of concentrated sin. And, and we're told uh, by one inspired writer that it's 10 times harder to raise your children uh, for God in the city than it is out in the country. And I thought, it's hard enough raising children. Why make it 10 times harder on myself? So I just right. decided to move out in the country years ago. And so we were going around encouraging many others to do this. Well, we had uh, a pastor of a Pentecostal church um, attend the meetings. And he came and he said, would you please come to my church and share this information. This was after he heard what you had to say. Yeah, because it was open to the public. And okay. we said, absolutely, yes, we will. Well, we wound up in this church. Um, it didn't happen immediately. We wound up as we went around uh, on our tour, and uh, we were in that church uh, months later. What's interesting is in the subsequent months, um, different brethren God had brought in, and they began teaching different things, talking about worship and and the ways of worship and the days of worship and all these different kinds of things. And this church, the pastor came under heavy conviction that not only had he been teaching false theology for many years, but that he needed to change. And so he actually went from being a, a, uh, a church and a pastor that had worship services on Sunday, he actually even changed, he went the next, went the next week and said, I, I've been, I just finally studied something out I have never seen. And he had been a pastor for 30-something years. He said, I had never seen this before. And starting next week, we're going to start worshiping on Saturday. And so the church congregation was like, what? What's going What's on? What's going on here? <laughs> Pastor's drinking some Kool-Aid or something, you know, whatever. You know. And uh, the reality was the pastor had been fed from the Holy Spirit. And he saw his folly. And so he said, next week, this church becomes a Sabbath-keeping church. That was phenomenal. Well, half of the people left. The good news is, half stayed. So now, enter our team to come in and teach on different things country living. Well, I had a seminar that was set up that dealt with entertainment. Like, for instance, if you're going to move out into the country, don't take the world of the city with you via your music collections or your satellite TV or whatever, because you could just be as just indoctrinated in the country as you could in the city sure. because of technology today. Now, technology is not a bad thing. We're using technology to, to talk about these subjects, and that's a wonderful thing. But most people don't use technology exclusively for good things. So that was the premise of my message and talking about music. I got the order from the pastor, not to me directly, through our leader of this group, don't touch music. 
we've made a lot of changes. Don't touch music. So I had been praying for a couple of days. Lord, what do you want me to talk on? God said, I want to talk on music. I'm like, okay, is this God or is this the devil trying to get us in trouble? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, this true story. Walk in the church, the full-on drum sets, they got everything going there. They had a lively service, and I'm like, and God's telling me, talk on music. And I said, brothers, God's telling me to talk on music. And my brother said, if God has told you to do that, we support you. Your team said My that. team said that. And I said, all right. The team I was a part of. They weren't my team, but yes. Right. So I said, all right, so inside I'm trembling. And this is largely uh, a black church. And they had a great ruckus of a time, okay? Now, I actually really personally love, love being in black churches. I do too. I love it. It's there, the energy that's there, the, the dedication that's there. These brothers and sisters love God. And, and they, it, don't, they, they, they never they don't, have a watch. They, do they? They, they, don't, they say, preach it. And I'm like, oh, I love preach this. It. Preach Man. it, preacher. Exactly. So I, I, in fact, I've kidded, I've, I've joked many times that I, you know what? Pray for me because I'm, I'm a six foot two black man trapped in a little white man's body, you know. <laughs> and they all just they just die, and and they think that's really funny. But the reality is, here I am, in this, and God is saying, I want you to talk it because it's a golden calf, it's a golden idol in this church. Long story short, short I went on for about an hour and fifteen hour, an hour and twenty five minutes, I think it was. And God directed, and the Holy Spirit really directed. The pastor, the people there, they got it. They understood it, and they said, wow. The pastor stood up, and he began to try to undo what I had just said. Okay, well, now we've heard from God's servant. We've heard from, the, from God's servant in the, the written word. We've heard from God's manservant. Now let's hear from the pastor. And he stood up, and he started to unravel what I had started to say. And God confounded that man's mouth. He couldn't make sense of a sentence. And at the end of it, the, through that little passage he was saying, God had so impressed his mind, he broke down, large, beautiful man. He says, we got to follow God. And we know what? We've done away with a lot of Babylonian things. We got to do away with all of Babylon. And the whole church going, amen, pastor, because they're loyal to their pastor. Sure, that's the very, one the yeah, very loyal. Worshipped on Saturday, the same pastor? Yeah, same pastor. Same, same. And he says, we have got to follow God all the way. Well, they got it out, and they changed their entire worship, and the church began to grow. True story. That's a real story. Amen. Yeah. Well, talk to me a little about the emerging church. Now, the emerging church mm. is kind of just emerging. That's why it's called emerging church. But, yeah, but... It's been emerging. Christianity Today had opening, their main article was on the mysticism of the Dark Ages. Right. And if we're going to proceed with our spiritual teachings and our spiritual preachings, we have to go back to go forward. That was the, yes. that was the title on the front cover. Right. I remember that. To go yes. forward, we have to go backward. Yes. So what's going on there in the emerging church, Christian? Well, I think before we get there, let's back up. Uh, just a little bit, and let's discover why people feel the emergent church has to happen. Okay. okay. So, many, many years ago, from medieval times to about 17, what it was, the French Revolution, 1785, 85, 85, 89, somewhere yeah, around there, yeah. um, was what we call the pre-modern era. And that would have been where everybody, all the way back to antiquity, believed that truth was given by revelation whether it was from God, the Creator God, or other gods. So didn't, nobody questioned there, was, there were good spirits and evil spirits. It was, and truth, absolute moral truth came from Revelation. And then after the French Revolution, to up until about 1970, we were in the modern era. And in that modern era, we had this um, period of time where, no, truth, there is no absolute truth. In fact, we shouldn't even seek after absolute truth. We will find absolute truth through scientific discovery, through rational thought. And so we can, we can discover it. And then when that all fell apart in the 70s and there was, there was none of that, which was heavily propagated on, on especially the American psyche by different people like Aleister Crowley and all of his cronies, and then Anton LaVey, who was the founder of the Church of Satan, and they kept pushing all of this stuff, for, looking for the dawning of the age of Aquarius. You know, everything was going to be great, exactly. and we're going to get to that place. We can create uh, 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 
Um, we can create this ecstasy in this wonderful place, and we can create and build into better human beings and all this type of stuff through science and through our own discovery. Well, then after that fell apart, because the only biblical model, the only world view that actually sticks is the biblical one. All the other ones have failed. Communism, no matter what it is, it they all come fails. And go. They come and go. They're fads. Um, and so then after about 1970, we enter into the postmodern era. And in the postmodern era, people were saying, you know what? <laughs> there is truth, but it's what you make of it. Yeah. It's, it's your There's truth. There's no absolute no truth. No absolute truth. Whatever you think is as good as whatever I think. That's right. And they may be opposites. They could be opposites. Yeah. So I could go off and have ten wives, and, and, and that would be just okay because that's my truth. And you could go off and sacrifice children, and that's your truth. I mean, I'm thankful we still have some laws that have some sense to them in these, in these right. lands. Right. Otherwise, imagine if there wasn't that restraint. Exactly. We would have killed each other a long time ago. So the reality is the postmodern mindset says this. Um, Whatever works for me. If I like it, if it feeds me, if it does what I need, that's my truth. That's right. So I could go off and do horrible, disgusting things uh, with men or women or children or whatever I want. And, well, that's, that's my life. You're, you can't judge me. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'll do what thou wilt. I'll do what thou wilt. I'll do what I want to do. So the reality is... The church began to struggle in about the 1800s because of this new thought that had started uh, with the modern idea, there is no moral absolute truth. And so they started shifting things even back in the 1800s of worship and worship styles. And it didn't become so much about orthodoxy or doctrine. It became more about an experience and a feeling. And if, at that point, music started playing a little bit of a role. Now, fast forward to the, the 70s and the 80s now, we're in the postmodern time. The church is seeing these people don't believe in truth. They don't want truth. They want an experience. And so the paradigm churches enter into the picture. They, they were called the market-driven or the new paradigm churches. Right. And that's where we get all these mega churches. Mega churches. Yeah, and, and they have amazing technology. They got rock stars going. They got all the stuff going. You walk in, they got, they don't have Starbucks. They have Sun Bucks, you know, like right. the Son of God, right. you know. They have all these kinds of things. And they have bookstores and daycare and plenty of parking. And, I mean, it, it, they, they basically started selling Jesus as a commodity, as a, as a product. And... Born out of that was a whole generation. It started about 20 years ago when these big churches really Willow, started to Willow, Willow was Creek. Kind of the kind of the model, you know. Correct. In fact, they even came up with steps. And then there was Rick Warren of uh, the Purpose Driven Life and right. Church and that type of thing. And they showed go out and take surveys of what the community wants, and then you design a church and you design a worship service to 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 feel to to feed their felt needs, not what God says they need but what the felt needs are. Right. So what happens then is we go into this, um, this industrialized commercial strength Christianity that doesn't convert people. It brings them in. They're incredible at bringing people in because the postmodern mindset is I want an experience. I want entertainment. Don't tell me what to do. I want to feel good about myself. There is no moral truth anyway. Who cares? Why do we even teach, teach the truth now? I have no idea why we need to talk about truth, because there is no truth. Your truth is mine, is yours, mine is mine, and this religion's just as legit as that one, and there's 700 of them anyway, so nobody has it right. right. Okay? So what happens is, there's a new generation that's born, they see the folly of the paradigm church. Enter the emergent church. This new generation is going, this is a bunch of commercialism. So they're going, no, 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 no. This, this industrial strength Christianity that's all commercial and flashy, and they're showing movies and all this kind of stuff in the sanctuary, they're going, no, 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 no. They don't have it right. Something's not right here. We need to get back to our past. And so that's how the emergent church has started to surface now because the, the, the old fad is wearing off. So now this is the new one. But the new emerging church is also for feely touchy. Oh, it is. They haven't, so so yeah. they haven't divorced themselves from that. No, but here's the feely touchy, as you well know. You're studying on the subject. The feely touchy now isn't all necessarily the whole, yeah, oh, and they're going crazy. They, the emergent church definitely has that. In fact, they'll meet in bars. They'll meet in nightclubs. They'll meet in microbreweries. They'll drink. They'll smoke. They'll do pot. They'll do illicit drugs, and they'll do sexual experimentation, including the pastor. Okay, right. so... 
the emergent church is not an evolving wonderfully on the pathway to heaven. It's definitely on the pathway of vice. Right. Okay? So we take <coughs> this new generation. They're young, interesting. Many of them look very hippie-ish. They like riding vintage bicycles. They, they love singing what they call vintage hymns. Because they love vintage, because it's, oh, sure. there's something special about it. It has about an aura it. It has about an aura about it. it, right, right, right. And the hair and the dreadlocks and all that stuff is there, you know, so not everybody. I'm not, I'm not trying to just, you know, generalize too much. But right. um, the reality is um, they want a medieval worship style now. They love worshiping in, yes, they'll have all the microbreweries and all that kind of stuff, but then they want to have an experience of the senses where they step into stone, buildings. They light torches. They light candles, old tapestries. They do chants. They do vintage hymns. One person perhaps with an isolated spotlight on them with a microphone and a guitar just singing Amazing Grace. And so they have this experience laid. Now there was an experience in the Paradigm Church, a whole different one, whipping them up, doing all this kind of stuff, emotionalism. Now there's somebody behind all of this, of course, and that's the devil. Right. Because he wants to get people feeling, not thinking. Because when you think, you go to the Word of God, and God can talk with that still small voice to your thinking mind and say, right. look at your soul. You need me. I need to save you. But when you're going into feelings, when you, when you have all these feelings going, and you have all these emotions, that could be attributed to God's working in my life when, frankly, it's a manufactured feeling. It's not manufactured by or given by the Holy Spirit. It's manufactured and we mistake it for the Holy Spirit. So we have this whole experience. We have this religious experience of, I, I felt God today. I didn't hear God. I felt God. Right. So I have a problem with this because my feelings and my heart, the Bible says, is desperately wicked. So could it possibly be that I'm feeling something that is actually not of God, but man-made, and it's ripping me off from a real connection with God. No question about it. It's not even man-made. It's satanic being made. And in fact, music plays the central role in creating the emotions. Now, I don't know if you followed or not, and I don't know the answer to this, but Willow Creek, just about a year ago, came to the conclusion, in fact, I forget, Hybo, I think Hybo is the, pa uh, the head pastor, said, it's not working. It, exactly. And I went, hallelujah. <laughs> so they came to the conclusion, look, this isn't working. No. So what have they put in its place? Have you followed? I don't know. When they said the emergent church wasn't, I mean, excuse me, the paradigm church wasn't working. Right. This is where the, the emergent church has begun. So I have not seen any evidence of change yet in the paradigm church. I'm not saying it's that not there. My, my family and I, my wife is my research team, and her and I really do this together. Uh, we had actually, on our way out here to Grants Pass, we wanted to um, stop by Willow Creek and be there for one of their worship or more, one, one or more of their worship services. It didn't work out in our schedule because I wanted to see, have they made any changes? So I can't speak intelligently to that. Yeah. I don't know. I, we researched and found, we looked. We didn't find any evidence that was, there were any significant changes. I, I continue to read in Christianity Today where they are struggling to get back to teaching a converting message. Yes, and they're losing a lot of people. Yeah, and so I think there are some honest pastors out there that, oh, realize, of course. that realize, hey, you know what? All of this faulty raw that we've been feeding our people yeah. is, is chaff. I think they finally discovered that, and I have some quotes that, that different ones had made that said, you know what? We're, we're great at bringing them in, but nothing's changing. And so if we bring people to a place, and what we do is, as a church, our standards should be here. Our standards should be biblical. The world, there should always be a difference, sure, right? absolutely. So when we lower the church's standards so we can be relevant to Harry and Mary, unchurched Harry and Mary, as the emerging church and as the, the uh, paradigm church calls them, 
then we lower the standards. Well, they, hey, they're going to come hang out with us because we have all the movies, we have all the music, we have all the food, we have all the coffees, we have all, whatever it is. And we have the sun bucks, we have all that stuff. And they're going, man, this is great. And it's a party. And they're going, well, but why am I even doing this? There's nothing here. Why am I here? Why am I here? But instead, if we, if we, we hold the standards of the, of, the, of, of the Word of God, where we're supposed to be, and, and reach down, if you will, not over, <laughs> Okay, but reach down and say, hey, Christ wants to lift you up. Then people stick and they stay. Because I'm, I know this because I myself was a convert. I was raised a heathen. I was raised, I wanted nothing to do with Christianity, nothing to do with the Father in heaven. And when I finally found Jesus Christ and saw, I had a distorted picture of the Father of heaven. If, if I had been introduced to a new paradigm church and never been taught that, it could have happened. I never returned to a church again in my life. Right. But praise God, I found these, these people called Seventh-day Adventists. And they were living as close to the biblical model as I had ever found. Now, they're not perfect either. I mean, I'm, I'm part of that church now. We're not all perfect. No one is. In fact, I told my wife, if I ever find a perfect church, I'm not going to join it because I'll probably You'll ruin mess it. mess it up. Yeah. So the reality is it's not about people being perfect. It's about are we on the pathway to heaven at least. Exactly. And living up to the light that we have. Well, I found that group of people that was doing that, and I was like, wow, this is great. You see, there was a difference, and they did reach down their hand, and they did lift me up. And I said, wow. So that was 15, 16 years ago, and I am more rooted and grounded in my faith today because they were different, and were supposed to be. That's exactly right. People should see this sermon more than hear it. Right. But I was wondering about, I'll go back to Willow Creek, if they figured it out mm -hmm. that it's not working the way they were doing it, now they're doing something different. Have they changed their music? Yes, you know? I don't know. I don't know that. <clears throat> I, I, I'm hoping that happens. And, and, and perhaps someday, uh, some, myself or someone else that can speak intelligently on the subject, we might be able to have a discussion on it. And, uh, and, and God can work some reformation. Because some of these pastors in, in, in all these churches, they're not doing these things because they're trying to deceive people. I don't believe that with all of my heart at all. I do not believe that. I believe anybody that gets in any kind of ministry, it, it is a service-oriented uh, industry, if you will. It yeah. is service. It is sacrificial. So you don't get into these things because you, you, you want to make money or you want to do all these kind of things. There are those that are out there. Sure, there's of a course. few. Of there, there's a few out there. But the reality is, I think the majority is, they have good, honest intentions, and they, they have the, the right motive. It's the methodology that's the problem. Exactly. So we're going to talk about some other subjects next week. Okay. You have mentioned, I saw in your notes, something about satanic churches. Mm. And I suppose they exist today. Oh, yes, absolutely. There are actually satanic churches proper. And they have many disciples. And they're willing to spend and be spent for Satan's gospel. Really? Oh, yes. Now, yeah. uh, let's see, I read about, what, what, do, you, what do you call them, Wiggins? Wiccans? Uh, Wiccans, uh-huh. Wiccans? Yep. Are they part of, the, of, the, are uh, they part of that program? You know, the devil has done so much. He has people over in Wicca. He has people over in uh, seeking after UFOs. He has people seeking after uh, celebration style uh, worships. He has, the devil has got something for everybody, and its great masterpiece <laughs> is almost to a culmination to where you almost... It's going to deceive the very elect. It's so good. The devil's come to church, frankly. Right, I'm sure. Yeah, it's incredible what's happened. So we're going to talk about that. So the viewers, I'm urging the viewers to listen next week. Next week will be the finale of this four series set. Yes, yeah. But you're coming back next year, right? I am. Praise the Lord. As we so, were going along, I talked to the pastor and he said, uh, I said, uh, so many people are coming up saying, have you, have you set the date? Have you set the date? And I said, Oh, uh, uh, no, I haven't. Well, well, what are you waiting for? We right. want you back. And don't make it a year from now. I said, well, I've got a lot of research to do. So, and I have a busy calendar of travel. So we already have it from the studio here. Yes. A few moments ago, guarantee that you and I can meet again. All right. So I want you to have all the answers <laughs> next week that you haven't had this week. All right. Now, so celebration. Now, tell, there's different kinds of celebration. We okay. have a couple of minutes. Okay. And you and I know celebration within the Seventh-day Adventist Church mm -hmm. and the wild celebrations that are outside of the sure, Seventh-day Adventist sure. Church. And I was just wondering if you've made enough rounds 
because I see some of these pastors in the Seventh-day Adventist Celebration Church mm -hmm. that are feeling their way and are conflicted. Mm -hmm. It's true. I th basically, here's what I think's happened. Fundamentally, there's a theological error. And some people do not think that there is, um, that they think right now everything was signed, sealed, and delivered at the cross. And it now, it's all time to celebrate. Theologically, I don't believe that. I still think there's parts to the plan of salvation. Christ is medi uh, mediator for us. He's ministering he, he for us. Ever liveth to make intercession. That's right. And he'll come back to redeem us. That'll be the day of celebration. That's so right. So if we are engaged in celebration type worships, and we know as stu Bible students that we're actually in the time of when it was called the Day of Atonement, when we should be afflicting our souls and saying, Lord, am I in the faith? And what do you want to change? And is my will in line with your will? And if we, if, we, if we don't think of our doctrine, we could be swept away with these celebration kind of styles. It's not time to celebrate. It's actually time to have introspection. It's time to be saying, Lord, is there anything in my character, anything in my home, anything in my life that's causing me to be distracted? Right. Causing me to be distracted right. from you and, and, and hindering my connection with you. If, if, if it was the day of celebration, then what's Jesus waiting for? Exactly. He's not finished That's until right. we have ser sealed the servants in their foreheads. And this is where my character is. Right. And if my character is for God, it's going to say God. And when my mind says God, and God has 144,000 according to Revelation that have the character and mindset of God because they've been be beholding God, not the world. They've been beholding and listening to Christian music, not worldly music or compromised Christian music. They've been changed in the image of God. God says, let's take them home. So God can take us home. It's not time to celebrate. But when that day of celebration comes, I'll be leaping and I'll be dancing and I'll be praising my God and I'll be, I'll be leaping around saying, give me a tambourine, give me a harp, give me a cymbal, whatever it may be. I That'll like, be the great day. I like the way you say it. It's not time to celebrate yet. That's, yet. That's yet. right. It's not time to celebrate. It's not wrong to celebrate. It's That's just right. not yet. It's not yet. Especially in our worship services. And then we will have time to celebrate forever. Amen. That's yeah. right. Let's have a word of prayer. All right. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you again for hearing your word. What does music which you had in heaven mm -hmm. do to us today mm -hmm. if it's been molested by the enemy? Guide and direct. May our viewers understand that the subject that we've talked about, that Christian has brought to us these past few days, is meant to impinge on our minds to mm -hmm. help us to understand what wrong kind of music can be. Yes, Guide us to understanding, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.